a real pleasure to introduce Justin McBrayer from Fort Lewis, Colorado, and he'll be giving a talk about about disagreement entitled "Everyone Else Is Thinking It, So I Can't We." Justin, thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I teach at a small school in a ski town in western Colorado. So it's very rural. We're about three and a half hours drive from the closest interstate, much less urban area. So what a treat to come to a place like Edinburgh and, and talk with uh, other philosophers and, and folks who study this stuff. This is a real pleasure for me, so thanks for having me. I've never been to Scotland before, but my genes have. I did a little research on family history before coming here, and I found out that the McBrayers uh, hail from uh, Lower Scotland near Dumfries. And our family motto is in defiance. I don't know if you can see that or not. When Anna, my wife, found this out, she said, God, I wish I knew that years ago before we got married. And I had the great pleasure of attending graduate school with both Patrick and Adam. And for the right price, I can tell you all kinds of stories later over a beer. Adam was legendary in uh, graduate school, in part for his ability to stay awake the 36 hours before he gave any sort of presentation. So he just wouldn't sleep the night before he had to present in a graduate seminar. And we're still not sure what kind of substances he used to stay awake for that period of time prior to uh, his talks. He was also known for the detail uh, and volume of his handouts when he gave a talk. And in fact, our logic teacher, uh, Paul Weirich, gave a class on decision theory, and he had a strict limit of two pages for your handouts. You could have a handout front and back, and that's it. Well, dutifully, Adam came to class with his two-page handout. But Paul Weirich didn't say anything about an appendix, so Adam had an 11-page appendix stapled to the back of his two-page uh, handout for Weirich's class. I have fewer stories about Patrick since he was a year or two behind me at Mizzou, though I'm told by some of his colleagues that in his very first graduate level class, he made what he thought was a very important philosophical point with Andrew Melnick, wherein Homer Simpson was the main character <laughs> to prove a particular example. Do you remember this? It's possible. <laughs> it's possible. Your colleagues remember it. So thanks for having me. Uh, I thought about a, a variety of different talks I could give today. I really work in ethics and philosophy of religion and not epistemology. So I thought to myself, if I had a bunch of epistemologists in the room, what would I want to ask them? What would I want to pitch to get their reaction to try to see what they thought of a particular issue? And one thing that really interests me are the epistemic principles that govern undermining defeaters that we get from genealogy. You know, if you know your moral belief was created in a particular way or your religious belief was created in a particular way, might that undermine your confidence in it? And I had this paper where I'm working out different, you know, chiseling through different versions of principles, but God, it was so boring. I thought I could go give this talk, but it would be really boring. The fun papers are papers where someone stands up, tries their hand at something really big, even though it may be a flop, and just tries to experiment with something that they haven't totally worked out. That's what I'm going to try with you today. So what, what would you say if I told you I had an argument that could settle virtually any contentious issue in philosophy or elsewhere? You would surely be incredulous. But I give you just such an argument. Here it is. First assumption. If most people believe something, then other things being equal, it's reasonable for me to believe it. Turns out that we can fill in these blanks any numbers of ways. Most people believe certain things. And as a result of what other people believe, it's going to be reasonable for me to believe a certain way. So I want to pitch a kind of argument that, if you want to think about it this way, is sort of an anti-disagreement argument. Not focusing on the epistemic implications of disagreement, but thinking instead of the implications of agreement. And there are lots of ways to fill in the blank. It turns out most people believe in God. So other things being equal, it's reasonable for you to believe in God. It turns out most people believe in free will. So according to this argument, other things being equal, you ought to believe we have free will. It turns out that most people think that morality is not objective. So other things being equal, you ought to think that morality is not objective. Now, I take it the second premise will be uncontroversial for a variety of different things that we could plug in. It's the first premise that's got all of you shaking your head, thinking that can't be right. 
We've all taught logic. This is surely something that's mistaken. And you're right, logic books agree. So here's an example of what's called, in this case, the subjectivist fallacy. This comes from uh, Norton.com, a textbook manufacturer. And the idea here is the majority of people believe something, therefore it's true. And the website clearly shows you that this is silly. No one should think this way. This is a fallacy. Um, if you identify the assumption that whatever the majority of people believes is true, is true, and it says majority opinions, obviously not infallible. Here's another example. This comes from logicalfallacies.info, so it's sort of an online catalog of fallacies. Again, the first premise of the argument that you just looked at is targeted. This is an appeal to popularity. Hindsight shows you that this is a fallacious way to reason. There have been times when the majority of people believe something and they were wrong. One more example. This one comes from Rational Wiki. Um, and this calls premise one of my argument an argument to the people. The idea that just because something's popular, it's true. If it's not even slightly ironic that this comes from a wiki page, hold that thought until later. The fact that a wiki is telling you that you shouldn't trust what most people think about something should have you a little bit worried. So argument one in, in the premise I just showed you is widely viewed as mistaken. But logic books get stuff wrong all the time. In fact, as Richard Joyce points out, the so-called genetic fallacy isn't really clearly a fallacy. You'd have to know more about the source of a belief before you're in a position to say whether or not finding out about the source of a belief undermines it or not. If you found out, for example, that your belief was caused in a way that um, produces 75% false beliefs, well, then it's not a genetic fallacy to say that I shouldn't trust that belief upon finding out about its origins. So we shouldn't just take logic textbooks word for it. So what could be said for the controversial premise one in my argument? The fact that most people believe something is a reason for you to believe it. I want to spend um, the bulk of the time today looking at what I think are four different reasons for taking premise one seriously. So four different reasons for thinking that the fact that most folks endorse something is, ceteris paribus, a reason for you to endorse it as well. And I want to start with an inference to the best explanation. So let me present some data. Um, Anna and I, my wife and I, took college students to Greece last year. And neither of us read or speak Greek. And we got off the airport and we were totally befuddled about where to go to find customs, to find our baggage. There were signs in Greek everywhere, but of course we didn't see Greek. What should we do? Well, what we in fact did was just follow the crowd. So people were getting off the plane, they were mostly shuttling in this direction. We thought, all right, we'll go in this direction. Does anyone read Greek or, or study Greek? Do you, can you read the sign? How did you get that sign? Uh, I have no clue where to go. The, go that's what the sign says. I have no clue where I'm going. <laughs> um, so we, we couldn't read, as my wife did that. She's a graphic designer, so she used Google Translate to plug that sign in. So we had no idea where we were going. We couldn't read the signs. But it seems totally reasonable just to follow the crowd. The crowd has similar cognitive equipment as we do. The crowd has similar goals as we do. It seems like this was a reasonable thing for us to do. And in fact, all of you probably do things like this every day. When you find yourself lost or you find yourself turned around, you follow the crowd. If that's reasonable, something like my premise one, something like this appeal to the majority principle would explain it. So this is one bit of data that stands in need of explanation. Here's another. Anne and I were uh, reading books about Scotland and about Edinburgh. and. I found the body of water called the Firth of Forth. Now, if you're Scottish, you have no idea how strange this sounds to American ears. The Firth of Forth. So I told Anna, I said, you won't believe this. There's this huge body of water. It's called the Firth of Forth. She's like, no. That doesn't even make any sense. What the so I said, oh, yeah? Let's Google it. So we did. We Googled Firth of Forth. First thing that came up was a Wikipedia page. And so we opened it and read about the Firth of Forth. It seems like that was a reasonable thing to do. It seems that other things being equal, this would give you a reason for thinking that there is such a place that's really named that and so forth. But all of you know how wikis work. Wikis are governed more or less by majority opinion. Anyone can jump on and serve as an editor. 
And as a result, you're trusting a kind of majority opinion when you rely on Wikipedia for particular things. Now, you may encourage your students not to cite Wikipedia in papers and that sort of thing if you're writing an academic paper or doing scholarly work. But I'll bet each of you has relied on Wikipedia at some point in time in the past for something or other. How do you explain why that's reasonable to do? The first premise of my argument would explain why it's reasonable to think that way. It's an appeal to the majority. Here's another bit of data. The moon landing was a hoax. What do you say about conspiracy theories? There are conspiracy theories for everything under the sun. Bush bombed the Twin Towers. The moon landing was faked. Pick your favorite. There's a conspiracy theory for just about everything. Almost none of you probably take those stories seriously. But why? If they're well done conspiracy theories, they'll be consistent with all of the evidence that you have. This is what makes them so intriguing, right? So a good conspiracy theory is one that will mesh with all of your other data. And yet, we don't take them seriously. We don't think that the United States faked the moon landing to bankrupt the USSR, as was suggested in the, the recent movie Interstellar. I don't know if you've seen Interstellar. They're teaching children in Interstellar that the moon race was a hoax that the United States used to bankrupt their Cold War enemies, the USSR. Why not take them seriously? If you think it's reasonable to adopt anti-conspiracy theory stances, why? Again, something like my premise one would explain it. You're endorsing a move because the majority of people accept a particular kind of explanation or a particular kind of theory. It's very hard to see how we would have any independent evidence or independent reason for favoring a traditional story as opposed to a conspiracy theory. So again, I think premise one explains that. Here's one more example. This poor bloke doesn't know where he's going. He's got his map out and he's asking a local, look, he's even wearing a little tartan hat because he's lost and he's in need of Edinburgh directions. It's reasonable to do that. Anna and I didn't know where the university was. We didn't have a map. We stopped and asked somebody. And he said, it's down this block. It seems totally reasonable to accept that kind of testimony. And testimony in general is accepting the word of someone else. What makes that reasonable to do? You probably all think it is reasonable. It was reasonable for this guy to think that the university was down a particular alley or whatever. But why? My first premise would explain it. The idea that if a majority of people believe something, that makes it reasonable for you to believe it as well. So there's a range of data, I think, that a lot of us take for granted. Testimony, conspiracy theories, following the crowd when you're lost, appeals to Wikipedia. We think these kinds of things are reasonable. What epistemic principle would explain it? I think premise one of my argument would explain it. Maybe you've got a better idea and you can tell me in a bit. So I have three more reasons for thinking that you should take premise one of my argument seriously. The first one has to do with a kind of interpretive dilemma. An interpretive dilemma that, at least as I understand it, was, was first noted by Quine and later developed in some of the work of Davidson. And the dilemma has to do with how you interpret someone who's speaking a language other than yours. Here's what Davidson writes. This is from Radical Interpretation, 1973. He says, to solve the problem of interdependence, between belief and meaning, by hold, we should solve it by holding belief constant as far as possible while solving for the alternative, meaning. This is accomplished by assigning truth conditions to alien sentences that make native speakers right when plausibly possible, according, of course, to our own view of what is right. And what justifies this procedure is the fact that disagreement and agreement alike are intelligible only against a background of massive agreement. So really, as I understand him, what he's saying is this. If you interpret your interlocutor as saying mostly false things, you've not interpreted your interlocutor properly. So Patrick lands on alien shores and starts putting together an interpretive schema for a new language that he's encountered. Well, if this schema has the native speakers getting it wrong most of the time, that's actually a reason to think that you're interpreting them improperly, right? So if you say 
look, every time they pick up a leaf, they say raspberry. You know, they're getting it wrong. They really should have said something else. Really what's going on there is you're not interpreting them properly. Native speakers get most of the things right. If you think that that's incorrect, that's a problem with your interpretation, not a problem with their grasp on the world. But then the implication from this is that if you're in a conversation with someone else and you're able to understand them, to assign meaning to their linguistic expressions, then to do that properly, you must assume that they're getting it right most of the time. But now it's going to be a short jump from that conclusion to the first premise of my argument. If they're getting it right most of the time, then other things being equal, you should trust them when they tell you something. If they're getting it right most of the time, then 50, more than half the time they're getting it right. So when they report a random belief state to you, belief state P, you know they've got greater than 50% odds of getting it right. And if they do, then other things being equal, you have a reason to trust them. So I think this is kind of interesting and kind of clever. There's a connection between uh, theories of interpretation, theories of how we grasp what others are trying to communicate, and there's kind of a pitch into epistemology, what's reasonable to believe or what's reasonable to think on the basis of that. So that seems a reason, again, to take premise one of this argument seriously. If you're not, you wonder how you're interpreting your interlocutor properly. Here's a third reason. And this is a kind of reason that's been explored uh, recently by Linda Zagzebski and um, a decade or so ago by Richard Foley. Questions about whether you should trust yourself and how that might extend to trusting others. So basically, I'm going to argue that there's a kind of analogy to trusting yourself and trusting your own cognitive equipment that could be extended to trusting others. And if then, the idea is if you trust others and you trust their equipment, then you should trust the kind of beliefs that their equipment provides them. And so again, other things being equal, the fact that they believe something should give you a reason to believe it too. So here's the idea. Most of us think that it's reasonable to place epistemic trust in yourselves. So you trust your own perception, you trust your own memory, um, you trust your reasoning abilities, and so forth. But premise two, you're relatively similar and relevantly similar to others. You've got similar goals, you've got similar cognitive equipment, and so forth. So if you trust your equipment, and you're similar to others, then you should trust their equipment too. And if their equipment is yielding a particular kind of verdict about their environment or surroundings, then it seems that other things being equal, you have a reason to trust what they're telling you. Now, it's defeasible, of course, um, but premise one of the argument is ceteris paribus. One more reason, as if you're not convinced already. Compare premise one of my argument, this problem of agreement you might call it, with debates in the epistemology of disagreement. So we can compare it to what's going on there. It seems that if disagreeing with people gives you a reason to back off of a belief, whatever that means, people who work in disagreement disagree, do you just back, you know, are you just less justified? Should your credences go down? Should you give it up? Whatever it is. If you, if disagreement provides you some kind of reason to back down, then wouldn't agreement provide you with a reason to come on to a belief, for lack of a better way to put it, to endorse it, to have a higher credence or more justification or whatever? Premise one is, is more or less the conciliatory view in disagreement. If you find yourself sympathetic with this idea that when you meet a peer and you disagree that you should be conciliatory in some fashion, then you're going to be friendly to premise one of this argument. But then premise two just connects issues in disagreement with issues in agreement. It says, look, if you buy the conciliationist view that disagree disagreement with others gives you a reason to back off, then it seems by parity of reasoning that agreement with others would give you a reason to come on to a belief. And so this argument is basically trying to leverage people who are already sympathetic to conciliationism to endorse premise one of my argument. Now, of course, if you find yourself totally unfriendly to conciliationism, you think, no, if I meet a peer and she disagrees with me, that gives me no reason whatsoever to back off a belief. You won't find this argument persuasive. But a number of philosophers do think that disagreement raises a serious epistemic issue. And so my question for them 
is what do you have to say about agreement? And I do think that there are options here uh, when it comes to matters of disagreement. Here's one thing you might say. You might say both disagreement and agreement are relevant. Both of them matter. When you run into disagreement, that gives you a reason to back off of a belief. When you want to run into agreement, that gives you a reason to come on to a belief. So this kind of way of solving this puzzle between agreement and disagreement is friendly to my position because it's a reason for endorsing premise one of the argument that we started with. You just think, you know what, Justin? Disagreement's a problem, but you're right. So is agreement. They pull in opposite directions, so other things being equal, when most people believe something, that gives me a reason to believe it too. That's a non-ad hoc um, coherent view. Here's something else you could say. You could just dig in your heels and say, nope, none of those guys um, who, who are working in disagreement have convinced me that it's a problem. Disagreement with others is not a reason to back off a belief. And Justin, you're just wrong too. Agreement with others is not a reason to come on to a belief either. So again, you treat the two on a par. You just say, disagreement isn't bad and agreement isn't good. I just don't care about that stuff. It, it's not epistemically relevant one way or the other. Now here's the last option. And I've talked with a few people who work in disagreement. This is what all of them told me, this last option, when I sort of floated this idea. They thought, you know, the stuff I work on, disagreement, it is really important. It matters for epistemology, but agreement doesn't. So they kind of held an asymmetry thesis. When you disagree with someone, that does provide you a reason to back off the belief. But I don't care about premise one of your argument. Agreement doesn't matter. So this is interesting. It'd be interesting if someone could explain why this asymmetry thesis held, why disagreement was epistemically problematic, but agreeing with someone wasn't epistemically positive in some way. But the few people that I've spoken with, this was sort of their knee-jerk reaction to the project. They thought, no, disagreement matters, but agreement doesn't. And I want to know why, if any of you are attracted to that way um, of solving the puzzle. So let me close um, with three objections, since I see you frantically writing them down anyway. So one objection. Other people aren't fallible. This is actually what two out of the three websites uh, that we looked at earlier, the logic websites, mentioned, right? Here's why premise one is false. Here's why reasoning this way is fallacious. Other people aren't infallible. They get it wrong. So you're trusting a source that's fallible, um, like the poor sheep here. That's not a good objection to the first premise of my argument. The first premise just said that other things being equal, trusting other people was a good idea. And all of our sources of information, as far as I can tell, are fallible. Testimony, perception, memory. It's not a good argument to say you shouldn't rely on memory because memory is not infallible. Of course it's not. The question is whether other things being equal is a good reason to trust it. So if you actually go back and look at the logic text that you've probably all taught from when you go through informal fallacies with your students, what it will say is appeals to the majority are not good. They're fallacious ways of reasoning because the majority can get it wrong. But by that logic, everything that you, you teach in inductive logic is also fallacious because induction isn't guaranteed to get you to the truth either. So it seems like a silly objection despite the fact that this is what's actually in um, our textbooks. Here's maybe a more serious objection. No traffic signs. You know what I'd do if I saw a sign like that. So you might worry that premise one, or the view that I'm endorsing, is self-undermining in a particular kind of way. Um, so you might think, look, what if it turned out that most people think it's not reasonable to trust the majority? If that turned out just to be an empirical fact, then it would be really weird. You'd be in this weird position where if the principle were true, it would then provide you with a reason to think that it's false, right? And other things being equal reason to dismiss it. So it seems like there's this kind of weird undercutting or undermining problem that my premise might have. If most people think it's not a good idea to trust most people, then if it's true that most people's believing it is a reason to think that it's true, then you have a reason to think that it's not okay to trust most people, which is totally weird. 
Now, I grant that this is, a, this is a problem, but it seems like it's also a problem for folks in the disagreement camp, as has been widely pointed out, right? Philosophers and peers disagree about what to say about the epistemic importance about disagreement. And so it seems that if these kind of conciliatory disagreement principles are right, then they're somehow self-undermining in a way. And so I grant that my premise would have that problem, but it's worse than the folks who are working in disagreement. There's a kind of undermining worry there. Last objection. You might just think, you know what? Patrick, you were thinking this all along, weren't you? You might just think, you know what? Those people out there are just sheep. They don't know what we at the top of the ivory tower do. And so we don't have to trust majority opinion because we should only trust our peers. And hoi polloi are not our peers. Right? So you think, I'm just smarter than you, so it doesn't matter whether you disagree, me about, disagree with me about this particular thing. Here's an example of someone making this move. Uh, Laura Callahan and Tim O'Connor have a volume of papers that came out last year on, it, um, I think they call it intellectual virtue and faith. It's on, on, on religious belief and intellectual and epistemic virtues and whether the two are compatible in the right kind of way. And Elizabeth Fricker has a paper in that volume. And she thinks that people who endorse religious beliefs on the basis of testimony are not justified in doing that. So when you believe that the bread becomes the body of Christ because the priest tells you so, Elizabeth Fricker thinks that's not a good reason to think that it actually becomes the body of Christ. And here's what she says about that. She says, you can't rely on the fact that one's own faculties are reliable to get you justification. The use of one's own faculties to acquire beliefs in the actual world doesn't lead to an empirical basis for a view that she calls modest epistemic universalism after Foley's work in 2001. She says, what one finds out is not that all humans are epistemically reliable about interesting topics just in virtue of their similar cognitive equipment. But instead, we find out that reliability is an idiosyncratic matter, turning on contingencies of temperament and experience like training, education, research, and so forth. So in other words, I'm smarter than you. The mere fact that you have the same kind of equipment and goals as me does not give me a reason other things being able to trust what you have to say about some particular thing. Now, I have a couple things I want to say about this objection. The first is that it seems to me that Elizabeth Fricker is trying to have her cake and eat it too. I mean, after all, She's trusting her own cognitive equipment to make these kind of empirical judgments, to judge whether or not other people are her peers. She's trusting her own equipment. But then again, if her peers, or if the, the folks around her, I don't want to beg the question by saying peers, if the people around her then have the same equipment that she just used to judge that they are or are not peers, there's something weird going on there. So it doesn't, it's not clear that that surmounts um, the sort of initial problem that she needs to. And then second, I suppose you could just grant Fricker the point that sometimes people are not reliable in certain cases and just treat that as a defeater. After all, my premise just said other things being equal. There's just this initial presumption that if most people believe it, then it's okay. And the idea is, you know, if later down the road you read Daniel Kahneman's book and you find out about things like anchoring bias and, and, and those kind of things, then you can take subsets of beliefs that are around you and you know that you shouldn't trust folks around you for this or for that or for the other. But what's happened then is there's an initial presumption that's later defeated. It doesn't show that the initial presumption wasn't there in the first place. And that's the only point I was trying to make today. So on that way of looking at it, I don't think Fricker's point sort of cuts against this initial prima facie um, plausibility that I wanted to establish. All she does is, is, is show you some avenues for defeaters that you could explore later. So in conclusion, um, what do I hope to get out of this talk, or, or what do I, what's, what's, the, what's the takeaway? I don't actually think that this is an argument that's supposed to settle things, right, that's going to settle all philosophical debates or supposed to end inquiry. But I want to do two things. <coughs> One, I'd like for philosophers to draw um, their attention to the kind of connections between various areas that seem to me haven't been sufficiently explored. So for example, connections between philosophy of language and interpretation and the kind of epistemic import of what it means to interpret someone correctly.
Um, so I think there's some, some fruitful ground here between our exploration of what counts as a fallacy and why, and what counts as proper interpretation, why, and so forth. So I think we need to pay attention to agreement. There's a kind of problem of agreement. And two, um, just to rile you up before the Q&A, I think that this is yet another example of the overall lesson that justification comes cheap. You might have expected this from somebody who's coming from Michael Humer's backyard in Colorado. The idea is justification is relatively easy to get. In this case, my point is that it's as easy as finding out that most people believe it. So in our main work in, in philosophy, it's not this sort of initial presumption or this initial justification that's hard to come by. What's really hard for us is the working through of all of the defeaters. That we have initial presumptions in favor of lots of things, but it's the settling those out into coherent worldviews. It's trying to think through all of these defeaters that we have for various issues. That's where the real work is. That's what's really hard, and that's where we need to focus our efforts. Thanks. <laughs>